Hello, and welcome to the Pit Pony Podcast with myself, Sharon Corley, and me, Sarah Dunwood, in which we talk to teachers from all walks of life who exited the classroom from what they thought was a job for life and thrived on the other side of teaching. Hello, friend. Hello, Corla. <laughs> should we uh, should we talk about the video that nearly never was? You mean the pit pony video we put up on YouTube that over a hundred thousand people have watched? Yes. Should we should we start by how it nearly never happened, please? In the uh, in the first of a series of catalogue of disasters with me with tech. We'd um, we'd sat down on a Sunday afternoon, hadn't we? And and we'll get to the reason why we did that. But we sat down on a Sunday afternoon, started recording with me, you, and Sue. Had just had a a very heartfelt Sue sharing her story, and then and then my computer pretty much decided to explode and just cut us off. So yeah, so there was a- so so you disappear. And I'm saying, and I'm saying to the sobbing Sue Bowie, thanks ever so much for sharing that. I know it's opened old wounds, but we're probably going to have you have to ask you to do it again when Sarah can boot back up her computer. So, can you hold all that grief and trauma, and can you reshare it? So, yes, and, and then, and then, just to compound things, I had to get on an old computer, which is why on the video, my my sound is. It's like I'm in a cupboard three miles away. <laughs> you and Sue are not clear. So, so when, 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 if if any of you do listen to the episode, which is going to be released as a standalone podcast, just to um, for some context, I am there, but you can't hear me. So, yeah, I was. And interestingly, there. if you watch it on YouTube, not only do you look like you're sat in a cupboard, you look like you're sat in a pool of shame. Because you've just put Sue Bowie through it. And you look stunned for about the first 15 minutes. So so we've started somewhere in the middle of an anecdote. Before we've actually really contextualised for our wonderful listeners, what is this pit pony video that's actually gone into the vernacular of the world of teaching? The pit pony video, Sarah. How did it all come about? What are your recollections? For me, there's there's three things, but I'm going to let you talk about two of them. The one for me is that Sue, who is also one of our moderators on the group, she was... Sue uh, Bowie. Yeah. Sue Bowie. She was one of our very early group members. She She joined when we only had a couple of hundred members. And she'd put a post on talking about her story and in that in that post she talked about the fact that she'd identified a tree to crash into not to finish herself off but to give herself whiplash or break a leg so that she could have six weeks off work to give herself some respite and that post just resulted in an outpouring of comments from other people along the lines of, oh my goodness, I thought it was just me. I had a barrier, I had a bridge, I had this, I had that. And the tree became, the tree is now very much a symbol, it's referred to as the tree in the group. But it was that for me, that was like, I we need to talk to Sue about that. But I know that that there was something else as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and the tree, to work out on your route to school in the morning, which Sue did, she passed this tree, didn't she? And as a maths teacher, hadn't she worked out the speed and the exactly. angles and the impact that she had to have at this moment in her time to just harm herself enough? And I think she said something, just a broken leg would have done it for me. And then at that point, as two people, we we absolutely read the comments of what people were putting. 
I think one member talked about she got the train to school every morning and considered just sticking her arm out. Wow. So so we knew even at that point something really I don't want to use the word special, but something really visceral. Powerful. Yeah. I had a really visceral response to that, mm-hmm. particularly in my own context of of where my mental health had been when I exited teaching. So it was it was really palpable and for me it was the it was the concept of wanting to harm to give yourself some guilt free time away from the environment that was making you feel so bad in the first place. Hey, that environment is teaching, which by its own definition of school puts children's mental health concern. It, it, it's to get yourself away from your job, which is a school and a classroom. It, it was it was mind blowing. But just to, and I'll talk about my motivation for wanting to record the Pit Pony video. The Pit Pony video, for those people who haven't seen it, was a YouTube video with three women, myself, Sharon Corley, Sarah Dunwood and Sue Bowie, who had exited the classroom. And it was a captured conversation that fundamentally goes into two main purposes and parts. Sue shares her story about the tree and the mental health and the impact that teaching was having on her at that time. Layered on top of that, for years, I like to consider myself one of the original OG pit ponies because I'd exited the classroom. And I think this is the important part of the pit pony. Those three women were totally financially dependent upon that job. Completely dependent. We were breadwinners. I was a lone parent. We'd not got high-earning partners. We were the original trapped in a job that we could not possibly consider leaving because of finances, childcare, holidays. And we were trapped in a world of pain that the very thought of exiting the classroom sent us into a flat spin. And we talked about how we did it because I had worked out a very simplistic financial blueprint for leaving the classroom. And the pit pony, in essence, captured conversations I was having three, four, five, six times a week. And I would get on the phone to someone or I'd drive across prior to life after teaching, sit down with someone with a pen and paper, And this is the essence of the video because do you know what's interesting about it? In our group, Sarah, people say, I've not watched it. I'm too frightened to watch this pit pony video because they don't know what what it's about. And that the heart of it is a very, very simple blueprint. You go to the last three months of your bank statements You work out what you need to spend and what you are wasting. You strip your finances right back to basics. You divide that financial income over your four weeks. Then you do five days of those weeks and you work out what you need to generate a day to keep a roof over your head. And we do it really, really. We walk through Sue's bottom line. We walk through my bottom line, what we got rid of. And how we manage to put ourselves in a financial situation where we go, I need to bring in £85 a day. And we're aware it's dated and aged. And we're going to do a little bit of a pre-record in front of the original Pit Pony video. But Sue talked about exiting the classroom and cleaning caravans for 85 quid a day, which kept the wolf from the door. So for me, it captured a resource for teachers to go and actually get a tangible plan about how to leave the classroom. So Sue had talked about her mental health issues and then how she found the strength to do this. So so in that respect, it became 
and still is an incredible, powerful watch that people watch multiple times. Do you remember at our conference, Sarah? Uh, so we we have a conference that we do um, through Connexus, which is another world in which we live. We have a tutors conference. And just what did I do at the start? I spoke. I was speaking to a room of 200 people approximately. Yeah. What quest? What did I ask them to do? Stand up if you've watched the Pit Pony video. And all about two American people who were in the room, the room got to its feet. And, and that was really powerful for me because we look at the metrics, we look at the numbers on YouTube. Don't even know what it is at this point to date, but it's, I think it's about 120,000 people have watched it. But to see 200 people stand up and one woman shouted, it's changed my life. Mm. Is, is that, I'm sat here with goosebumps now because I'm the same as you. When when there's, you know me, I love a good bit of statistical analysis. I'm a complete nerd. I do love it. So I do know how many times the video has been watched and all the rest of it. But, but they're, they're abstract numbers to see that many people stand up with with me you and sue at the front mm-hmm. of the room as well was a really emotional moment in and of itself so it's, that's just brought that back home and i think as well when we when we were in that position and it was only a couple of months ago that the overwhelm from that for sue and she will not mind me saying this because 200 people saw this it took the legs from underneath Sue because actually I it, that was about Sue's story and your financial blueprint. And I think for Sue to actually see so many people go that massively impacted on me was a really emotional moment for her. But yeah, it was, it was a few months moment. Because I think what we do is, and this is what we talk about this all the time, we talk about it on the 25th hour of the day that we're on the phone to each other. Because we've got a really, really beautiful friendship. And and I think that shines through with everything we do. We're so aligned in our values. We're so aligned with our purpose. <laughs> me, and thee, <laughs> me and thee can be on the phone, <laughs> right? And whilst we're on the phone, you can be texting me or yeah. replying to something I've done on WhatsApp, or we're on Messenger on the lap chat, then we're dealing with a work email. And I think to we keep our feet on the ground. So we don't lean into the hundreds and thousands and the metrics. And that's why I stay away from it, to be honest, because the minute it becomes real and we start to absorb the impact within us that it's having on people, it'll frighten us to death. And we'll shrink. So we actually like to quite, like what we're doing today, me and you are just sat chatting. And in my head, I'm thinking, no one's going to listen to us two rambling on about a bloody pony video. So, yes, it started with Sue. It started with the financial blueprint and bringing those things together. But I think what else it did, it brought the word and the concept of the tree very much to the fore in teachers' minds. But let's not lose sight of the wording that sits behind it, the pit pony. We are on a pit pony podcast. And what had happened the night before, I was chatting to Sue on the phone and I said to her, do you know what you are? You're classic, Sue. You're a pit pony. You're an educational pit pony. She's from Cornwall, Sue. Sharon, what's a pit pony? I'm like, oh, Sue, Sue, Sue. But I think it's worth just pulling that out a bit, really. What is a pit pony in terms of a a teacher, a TA, a head teacher? Going back to what a pit pony literally was, they were a worker, an animal, born and spending most of its working life underground, unaware of a world above it. And then either through illness or retirement is raised out of that pit into a world that completely stuns it. Well, take your average teacher. Where are they by the age of four? 
They're in school. They're led by bells. They go to the toilet at break time. If they're lucky. As a kid, you can. Oh, yeah. And, and, and walking through the journey yeah. of a kid, they are in and out of classrooms. They've got textbooks, exercise books. They go to the dinner hall. Now, you imagine then doing your A-levels. You have a break for about three or four years at university. You've still got a timetable. You've got tutors. You've got seminars. You've got lectures throughout your 18, 19, 20, 21. You're still in education. And then guess what you do by the age of 22? You're all right. Straight back in. And when you're straight back in, and that's what it's been all of your life, not just your working life, all of your life, you do, you centre everything around weekends. Because you don't take a Thursday off with annual leave. You go on holidays at a certain time in the year. You work two half terms. You know one of the things I talk about, teachers do two forms of marking. They mark books and they mark time. Yeah. And actually... Mark, mark in time, it, it, you've just hit on something for me, is you do live to the next holiday almost as a marker in the sand of I can catch up at that point, I can catch up with my life admin, I can catch up with cleaning the house and and catching up on work that that there isn't time to do. And the the inevitable thing that happens the older you get as well is those those half terms do feel like they get quicker Mm -hmm. and then there's a moment where you go I've counted my life in half terms for 20 odd years where's my life gone correct and then when you do get those moments where you you have a break because it's a half term every man and his dog's on half term so booking holidays become more expensive, even taking the kids to the local swimming baths. Everybody's there. So you live in this world and, and, and you use expressions like, well, it's a school night. There's a concert coming on. Well, it's on a Thursday. It's a school night. That's still the mentality we had when we were seven years old. Come on, it's a school night. You need an early night. And then, you know, and then what else happens is If you find yourself as that educational pit pony in a toxic school environment, because some people will talk about it and say, it suits me. Mm. We go full on at term time and then I shut my laptop and we go caravanning for two weeks at Easter. Perfect. But if you are then in a toxic environment as the educational pit pony, one of the biggest mental health pain points we have in life after teaching is Sunday nights. Oh, goodness, yeah. Antiques roadshow music, anyone? Whoa, trauma, trauma. Last of the summer wine, game over. You know, it's... And we have a spike in our Facebook group on a Sunday night because they've managed to get through till Friday. They collapse on a Friday night doom scrolling wine netflix they've got to then ram everything into the saturday to convince themselves they are having a life mm. then by the time it comes in you're right it's the smell of sunday dinner it's, it's bisto that's it yeah. and and it's interesting isn't it funny how certain things evoke memories i used to as an adult go to my dad's every sunday with my then husband and my young child and we'd have Sunday dinner but it was a hard rule in my head we had to be away from dad's by five o'clock so I had time to get my child home bathed into bed ready for school so I could then work to and and everything working around everything in life working around what have I got to do what have I got to do for work? And I think that's where we become the pit pony because I, I, I talk about this a great deal. To me, a job is on three levels. Fundamentally, human beings work to leverage a financial remuneration in order to buy stuff, food, rent, mortgages. That's fundamentally why we work. It is a financial 
transaction for services, labour, trade, goods. That's great. So therefore, if you are doing that, then proportionally, it should only be a certain amount of your time because I'm going to just pluck some figures because I know you as a nerd will go, that percentage that you've just done, Sharon, doesn't work out. So just bear with me. If I'm working 40 hours a week, okay, but in a week there's way more hours than that, then those 40 hours should provide a standard of living for the rest of my time. But if the rest of my time is then consumed by that job in my head, exactly what you said, cutting across what was technically your day off, you're still working. So that's the that's the baseline. A job should provide you with a financial exchange in order to live. What's really great is if that job also provides a purpose and you enjoy it and there is job satisfaction. And whilst you're doing it, it's great, but it doesn't take over your life and you actually get what we used to call job satisfaction. Superb. But then I think this is where, as pit ponies, we get it wrong. We don't see what we do in the classroom as a job. We've skipped those first two stages. It's our vocation. Yeah. It's our vocation. It is, it's about the kids. It's, and we attach all of this guilt to what we do. I can't possibly take time off because of the kids. I am serving. I am on purpose. Well, number one, your teacher's salary ain't that much. Number two, you can't be doing those things if you're in a toxic workplace. This is what the top of that pyramid should look like. I have monetized my joy. And actually, I don't even feel like I have a job. I am paid to do what I love. And that's where we get it wrong as teachers we think we're being paid to do what we love because that's how it started. Mm. But very quickly, you think about yourself as an NQT. Can't believe they were paying me Correct. to be doing this. I'm getting, I'm getting a getting a salary at the end of the month for this amazing wall display I've done, and I'm I'm picking the book I want to do with the kids. And, and just for context, mine and your NQT years were very different than what an ECT has yeah. to do. We we went into the profession in in what was a really lovely time mm. to go into the profession. So please don't think that we're sat here as two middle-aged women going, oh, that's great when you start teaching yeah. now. We know it's not. But from our perspective, it really was. It was mid-90s, it was- the, the halcyon years. <laughs> you, you, you rocked up and your head of department said, Right, watch fancy teaching. There's your stock cupboard. I didn't even know the word scheme of work. Um, never had a lesson observation. So you're absolutely right. Uh, we're talking about how that felt at the beginning. Well, that's almost what you trauma bonded to. Why doesn't it feel like that anymore? So, and, and I think it's important. That's the pit pony. That's the person who's known no different than this educational structure of their world. So with that in mind, that's why people, even though they know they're unhappy, they they know they've got a tree, they know they are totally financially dependent upon it as a lifestyle, are absolutely frightened to death at the thought of leaving because a true pit pony in, in education goes, I'm just a teacher. What else can I do? Oh, I hate that word, just. But it is true. They do. If I'm not a teacher, if I'm not a TA, what on earth can I do? And that's where, and that's the true pit pony. I mean, how am I going to cope if I've not got the six weeks holidays for childcare? How how am I going to cope if I, and this is where the, they gaslight themselves, I can finish at three o'clock in a day and pick my kids up. Yeah, but do you? 
yeah, you might finish, pick the kids up, and then what happens the minute they shut their eyes? You're back working again. We become trauma bonded to that. To what false narrative? False narrative. And that's what I mean by that pit pony, because when you do come above ground, you lose a... Sometimes we stay in the known, even though it's painful, because the unknown is even more scary. It's like marriages. I'd rather stay in a bad marriage because at least I know better the devil you know kind of thing. And I think that's what the pit pony was about towards the end as well, because when these people were resisting, I'm just a teacher, when they were having those conversations with me. Yeah, it's all well and good, Sharon, £85 a day, but what can I do? Yeah, but I don't... Yes, I could be an Amazon van driver, but what... And the minute we re, we meet resistance with the pit ponies, this was this was the moment, I think, where... And I think this is possibly the reason why 200 people stood up in this room, because I deliver a hard, conceptual question. Do you have children? And I would say on average, most of them do. Do you have kids? Yes. Tell me what, through the lens of your child's eyes, they are seeing now. They're seeing a mum who's saying, I'm going to have to take you from granddad's now. I know you're playing Lego with him, but we need to go. They're seeing a mum who is trying, this was my trick, flick four pages at once in the reading book to get to the end when I'm reading with my kid, mum, you're skipping pages again. I know because I, because of the anxiety, because I've got that much to do when I get downstairs. Do I really need a bath? Do you really need a bath tonight? So I say, what's the, what's the lens that your kids are looking through? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, they see me cry. They see me drinking too much. They see me arguing with my husband who's telling me to leave, right? And then I say to them, what is the biggest role model for a child? They watch our behaviours. They very rarely listen to our words, but they copy our behaviours. What are you teaching your child about what a job looks like and feels like in your home? Because if you can't get out for £85 a day because you don't see your own self-worth, then if it's going to impact your kid, later on in life and at that point that's the epiphany of the pit pony what am I modeling for my kids with what I'm teaching them about staying in toxic environments you're teaching your children that you stick at a bad relationship you stick at a job where you are not happy you stick in situations and that's the liberating moment for I think the people who've watched it I might not see my self-worth, but I am not damaging my kids with my inability to leave the job. And some people, Sarah, they stay in the classroom when theirs isn't even the wage that keeps the roof above their heads. Yeah. Yeah, that blows my mind every time we have conversation with somebody and we get to that. I, that nub of it, and actually, that's now a, a starting point, isn't Correct. it? Because because the number of times that you or I have had conversations, and it's and it's desperate, and then we get to that that question of, are you the breadwinner? Is there another income in the house? And there, and, and there's a oh yeah, my my wife, my partner, my husband, they they, I don't need to work. Oh my goodness, then what are you doing? These are, these are how my conversations start in an evening with members in crisis. And I'm brutal because my time is so so um, pressured because there's so many. I say, right, okay, first question. No preamble. What's the critical incident that's made you post in the group? I really, really focus them in. I was brought into my head teacher's office today. I have been suspended from school pending this. Right, perfect. I have gone to the doctors. I've not been able to get out of the car today because I can't stop crying and I've been sent home. Right, let me start there. Then within, and I pause them. Sometimes I have to do deep breathing exercises with them on the phone. And then my next question is this. 
talk to me about your money. And the first question I, I tend to ask is, how much is your mortgage or your rent? Because I can get a ballpark then. Mm. And, and some of them are so low, £500 a month. Right, okay, I've got some skin in the game here if you're only having to find 500 Are you on your own? Do you have a partner? And we start from there because there are people who are real pit ponies who don't have to work. Or then they'll say, Sarah, I only work three days a week. Right, so you're working three days a week. The two days you you have off, you're catching up on the three days that you need to do. And how much are you bringing home? £1,400 a month. Do you need that £1,400 a month? No. And then, but I've got an exam class, but um, we can't get supply at my school. Bang. Have you got your own kids? Yes. And that's then how I break down that pit pony mentality. They come out, and I don't know if you found this with the countless people you've talked to who've been pit ponies, once they're in that field, I see them a bit like a foal, you know, that's just been born. His legs are shaky and wobbly. Yeah. And they're a bit dazed and stunned because they've lost their identity. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that goes back to the the I'm just a teacher um, actually isn't rooted in diminishing being a teacher. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's all I know and... It, it's right at the core of my identity. Yeah. What What am I? What am I? Who am I? If I'm not a teacher. What am I doing that? Another thing that I get, and I speak to men and women in the 40s, and I know it would have happened to me, they're too frightened to tell their parents. Yeah. Because they go back to that those halcyon days that we talked about where their parents were going, they've got a job for life. I was Sue's a teacher. Wow, because the parents of pit ponies in the main, females over 40, men over 50, they're the ones who are getting the bullseye on the back, but we'll talk about that another day. Their parents came from a generation where teachers were in the same vein as solicitors and doctors. So the pride they've got attached to the with their parents is a trauma bond as well. So do you know what I always say? This is what you need to say to your mum and dad. Tell them you are having a sabbatical for a year because nobody knows what a sabbatical is and it sounds really good. Tell them you are going on sabbatical for a year and you are tinkering around the edges of consultancy. That will shut your parents up. And they go, (laughs) oh, that's genius. Don't worry, mum, I'm leaving teaching. I'm I'm not leaving teaching. I'm having a sabbatical for a year and I am going to become an educational consultant. Then go get a job in Marks and Spencers because that's all your parents need to hear. So I I now know I'm responsible for many teachers in the profession lying to their elderly parents. So I'll take that one for the team. I mean, it's it's the cycle, it's the circle of life that you lie to them when you're a teenager, but why not when you're a bit older? Yeah. Oh my God. But I know my dad would have been absolutely, he could have seen me on my knees. Now my dad wasn't with me when, when I left. And I hemorrhaged out. I I absolutely hemorrhaged out. He would have gaslit me through love. Sharon, it's your pension. He would have been my own physical limiting self-beliefs that would have kept me in that classroom. Because there is no greater image or metaphor or symbol than the pit pony. Because they were bloody loyal workers down the mine. Right. Relentless. Load me back up again with more coal and send me down that track. Because even when they were raised above into their fields, they still followed the same track. And pit pony fields, particularly where I was brought up, they had circles in them because that was what the pit pony still did. So you can't have a better metaphor to hang it on because it works on so many levels. You cannot have a better and more powerful opening story from Sue Bowie that resonates on so, so many levels, sadly. Then you have the basic, go to your last three months with the bank statements and get rid of bloody Sky Sport and your gym membership 
and your and your daily coffee at Starbucks. Your takeaways, because do you know what you'll be eating fresh and making casseroles and saving a fortune, and then you have some of the mindset stuff at the end where we talk about the role model you're being for your child. We talk about how you can create your own CPD with mindset. You can start reading great books like The Law of Attraction, watching TED Talks, meditation, how you can create a healing plan for yourself outside of the classroom. So I think what we captured that day, despite <laughs> the TED you. Rock. To be fair, Sarah, I have been on a Zoom with you where you were struck by lightning. Oh my god. Well, you weren't you weren't tired. I wasn't. But the, but yeah, it did. It arced. <laughs> well, my phone, literally our phone caught fire. Um the computer was fried. I have the worst luck, genuinely, with tech. Before <laughs> and I'm like Oh my God. And I'm sat opposite you. I'm zooming this bolt of lightning goes behind you. And and even before we've started recording the Pit Pony podcast episodes, and they are going to be fa- fantastic because what we've now done is we've, expa- we've expanded it into a franchise of the Pit Pony sequels. We've got everyday Pit Ponies coming on, talking about their moments when they're raised above ground, the strategies they use to thrive. They, it, they're fantastic. I mean, you know the quality of the guests that we've got lined up. It's amazing. But that video, to me, is one of the most powerful things you can sit down and watch if you are feeling really low. I've had people send me um, messages where they've screenshot, they're watching it on the big screen in the house, and I'm cringing. Oh, cringing. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I yeah, my hair wasn't even brushed. I don't wear well, makeup. I lost that in the pit of shame for having yeah. met the original video. Oh god, that's awful! I'm wearing glasses and I've got a pair of sunglasses on my head. I've got all the glasses going on, but what we've done is going back to our tech issues. We've made absolutely sure we've belt and braced everything this time, rather than doing. I know, I know. Sure. Are we st- we still do that thing, don't we? we go, no one's going to listen to this anyway, so what does it matter? Yeah, what does it matter? Yeah. What does it matter? But I think just bringing it to a close now, It's I think this has been an important episode to contextualise that Pit Pony video, which has aged relatively well. The figures probably still don't work out and... There's probably no, it's the principles, isn't it? It's the principle of how you how you get to get to your bottom line, and that fundamentally is is right at the heart of that. Because without being able to do that, and it's it it's one of those things where it feels really obvious when you talk about it. Oh yeah, that makes complete sense. But unless unless it's in your head to do that. And and we will talk about this in a in a different episode. What I did when I came out of teaching because I'd done that. Unless it's for sometimes it's so blindingly obvious that you don't see it. And that was it for me with the pit pony video. It was the right do this this and this because when you get down to that daily rate and you go, what it's less than a hundred quid that I need to take home. Right, well, I can go and do X, Y, and Z for that. Yeah. And people people then have to do a mindset shift where they go, I can't, I need three grand. So when anybody ever says that to me, I sit and I go, right, okay, let's have a look where that comes from. And sometimes um I was I was doing one the other the other night on the phone and I was saying, Well, I, my children's school my, my my meals for my children at school is quite a lot. I said, well, how much does it come to these school meals? Because that was a sticking point. Mm-hmm. For some reason, she'd fixated on school meals, and I think it's more an indication of people's um, mental state. To be honest, they're clinging on, and their time, and that, yeah, clinging on. And then when I actually got to the real nub of it, 
The kid takes pet lunches and occasionally has a school dinner. Because the false gaslighting that we do. Yeah. And there's so many different ways. And the three grand, I can can pull that down quite, quite easily because your kid's ballet lessons or your holiday or whatever it is that you are wasting that money on, what we always say about the Pit Pony video is it is a lifeboat. It is not forever. You will build back up. There are so many things you can be doing. You can be tutoring. You can be marking. You can be working in a shop. You can have a part-time job in the civil service. You do whatever you need to do to pull in that bottom line. And I'm telling you now, it flips it for me because when an employer sits in front of you and says, what did you used to do? And you shrug your shoulders in shame and say, I was a teacher, they will snatch your hand off. For the work for your work ethic alone, <laughs> your 80-hour weeks that you take as normal. So, yes, I think the pit pony as a concept has stood the test of time and worked really well. I think the pit pony podcasts are going to provide the inspiration and the blueprints of people's experiences that will become so, so powerful for people who are in that pit. See how it works on every level. That's the English teacher in me. Yeah, I've been thinking that all the way along. Yeah, just can't help yourself. Can't help myself. I, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting extra marks for extending that metaphor right the way through. <laughs> Sustaining it along the way. It's brilliant. So. Thank you. Thanks for spending some time talking about this, Sarah, because it really nearly didn't happen because of you. Yeah, bless bless me, Father, I have sinned. So thank you to our listeners for indulging us again, talking about the pit pony and where it's all come from. And um, we just hope what's provided for you in the pit pony podcast will be as powerful And if you subscribe to whatever channel you are listening to, you will get them out weekly. We're talking to real live pit ponies. The the range of accents, oh my God. It's it's going to be a cacophony of accents, our podcast. It really is. It's not just going to be our northern grinding vowels. So you're going to get you're going to get some southerners and some Geordies and some Scottish people and some poshos. We've got them all. (laughs) <laughs> so so that will that will be the antidote to our accent so thank you for listening to this episode a special episode and i think one that was needed to contextualize a very powerful powerful piece of video that has changed so many people's lives and from both of sarah and i i hope you were one of them thank you as always for listening to our pit pony podcast On behalf of Sarah, our guests and all involved with the production, we're so grateful for your support. Please subscribe to our channels, follow us on social media and we look forward to seeing you next time when we will have another inspirational story from a fellow pit pony who has exited the classroom and thrived.